I would know you anywhere, Joe. You look yeah. just like your brother. Yeah, we have. We all have this uh, look about us. I, it's it's part. <laughs> there's various things. There's premature gray. There. <laughs> now we. Uh, yeah, we all turn gray early. So my wife is older than me, but they all say, "Wow, Joe, you're you must are you retired, Joe?" And I'm like, "No, she's older." <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't help any, Janet. I still get ageism everywhere. So, but anyway. all right, me too, man. I've been gray since I was forty. So and that was you? a long time ago, Joe Collins. We well, were just talking about you, and we don't even know you because this, um, in my household. My oldest child, Leah, is best friends with your niece, Elise Collins. I know. I know it. And that gorgeous Elise Collins, I am worried about enormously, and I can't even imagine how her parents are right now. Well, the last I heard, Janet, uh, <sighs> is your daughter there? Or? Yeah, she is. But anyway, uh, last I heard, we had a we had a little family Zoom, as everybody's doing the other night, with just my siblings. I did... Dan, me, and then my two, our two older sisters. And Dan said, basically, she's doing fine. She's working an overnight shift. Uh, and if anything, and people drive by and honk and bring food and all that stuff. But beyond that, she just gets lonely being stuck in her. She's very social. I don't know if your daughter's well, the same You way. know it. No, my child is an introvert. Okay. Elise was the public one of the two of them and really <laughs> helped Leah enormously in high school because Elise is fearless socially. And Leah's like, eh, I don't know. So Elise was has been a very big presence in our household. Well, I was many. excited. I, I may have known that, uh, Jan, because actually – um, I, I, you and I actually, not really formally, but I used to participate when they had it in the uh, Fort Wayne Playwrights Competition. And oh, you were yes. there one year to, yes. uh, okay. to whatever they call that, arbitrator or, or to, to, give, <laughs> to, to give wisdom or whatever. So you were very friend, you were very friendly that day, and it was nice, it's nice that you came all the way up to Fort Wayne to listen to some, uh, some of that. So. Well, I was happy to and always wish that I had more time to do things like that. Of course, now I kind of have nothing but time. <laughs> so well, um, wow. so anyway, yeah, I go, I'm Fort Wayne. We're all from Marion. Dan and all of us are from Marion. Oh, and I've it, forgotten that. Yeah. And we were all big theater people. Uh, yes. Or, all, you know, I'm just saying we all loved it because my mom always did a lot of things with, of imagination with us. She wanted, you know, we played games like that. And so... Uh, we all got into it in our own way. So uh, Dan hasn't been anything in a while. And I, I was about to be in, tonight was the premiere of Noises Off uh, that I was going to be in, in at Fort Wayne Civic. But uh, that was my first show in 26 years. But of course that was canceled too. Oh, I'm so sorry. What were you playing? Well, I was playing, I was playing the old guy, of course. Right? Selden. Yeah, but anyway, I, I, it was, uh, it too was young for Selden. It would have been fun. <laughs> Uh, and it looked like a really good cast. So I had a Zoom chat with them, too, and the director to talk about the state of of theater and things like that under these extraordinary times. So we'll do a bit of that with you, too, as you have patience. Great. Have you been with IRT forever, right? A long Practically time. forever, Joe. Yeah, yeah. In two different pieces. I started right out of graduate school. And then I left for a while and then I came back. So I had a little um, brief mid 1980s sojourn in New York where I actually was still working part-time for the IRT, but I wasn't there working full-time. And then I came back as an associate artistic director in, oh heavens, 87 maybe, <laughs> something like that. And then I did 10 years as an associate artistic director, and then I was promoted to artistic director. Now, I know you came from Chicago. Yeah. I read one of your pieces. I read some pieces on this being from, you were, you were in, inadvertently kind of in theater, like a lot of, if I remember, like a lot of people get into, and you kind of moved your way into more and more involvement. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it is fair, yeah. I was born in Chicago, in Cook County, much to my lovely deceased mother's chagrin, we used to say, yeah, we were born in Cook County. She's like, don't tell anybody that. <laughs> Why? And then uh, my dad's business moved downstate to Bloomington Normal, Illinois, um, 
when I was in elementary school. So I actually really grew up more in, in normal Illinois, of which I'm very proud. Uh, we went to the Univ Illinois State's University High School, which was a wonderful high school education. And then I went right to Illinois State, um, almost without transition from high school. <laughs> I just moved down the street. And um, I, I started doing theater in high school. Uh, I actually had seen not a ton of theater as a kid. Um, I had been taken by various family members to road shows, but for when I was a little kid, there was no roadhouse in Bloomington Normal. You had to go to Champaign Urbana, to University of Illinois, to the roadhouse. So we went to the roadhouse a fair amount over there. And um, my father had a lot of art making friends in Chicago. And so we did see some plays in Chicago. They were mostly amateur productions, um, but I didn't grow up with tremendous access to the theater. I thought actually um, as a young person that what I really wanted to do was teach children to read. That was my animating thing was reading. And I was and, and still am a very, very avid voracious reader and that to me was just the keys to the kingdom so i taught all the little kids in our neighborhood how to read when they were little and so i thought i was going to be a teacher at some point um i i was never in a play or even interested in being in a play because i was pretty shy but i tried out for a play in high school and i stupidly got a very large role and it was not the ambition part of it that spoke to me so much. It was the action of language. It was language being made um, tangible and moving in the air and story being so um, sort of viscerally transmitted between actors and audience that just absolutely sent me forever. I quickly figured out I didn't want to be an actor The sheer repetition of it was not is not what my brain is set up for. So I did, uh, I did some acting in high school, but I also did a lot of other theater work in high school. So I learned a little bit how to direct. I learned some technical functions. We happened to have a statewide winning thespian team at U High, University High School. Um, so we traveled all over the state doing um, thespian competition stuff, which was a big deal in Illinois. I actually don't know how big a deal it is or was in Indiana. This was, you know, a long time ago, Jim. So um, I went to Illinois State to study what I thought would be an academic theater path where I would teach. And uh, in part, I went there because uh, Having gone to UHI, I could transfer some of my credits and get through college quickly, which sounded really cool at the time. But I had no intention, even when I got to undergraduate school, to act, and I didn't act at all as an undergrad. I learned a lot of different disciplines, and one of them I started to learn a little bit about was dramaturgy. But there wasn't much field of dramaturgy in the American theater in the 70s when I was an undergrad. Um, uh, so I kind of jumped then to graduate school at Indiana University, and I was following uh, a professor whose um, books I were, was very taken with. This is Oscar Brockett, who was the writer of the great theater history textbooks of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and I think maybe the last edition was in the 90s. I was very taken with his view of theater because it was very um, uh, cross-referenced. It was very much about social history, about cultural history. It, it did not feel like it was in this narrow little box that was just theater. And so that was what really turned me on. So, but in graduate school at Indiana University, they required all, we, I was in a master's program. They required all of us in the master's and PhD programs to act or so it seemed to me at the time. <laughs> so I was acting again, and I really did not enjoy it very much, although in retrospect, I'm very glad I was forced to do it. 
because if my only acting experience was as you know a teenager, I don't think I would have been very prepared for the job I've held for the last 24 years. Um, so I, I retroactively am grateful to that faculty for making me, but I literally would say to my professors who are directing me, okay, just tell me what you want me to do, I'll do it, okay? I do, I'm not interested in inventing it. I, so I was a very, I don't think I was a very good citizen. <laughs> I just don't think I was. Um, but I learned a lot and that was very good. So I went to graduate school thinking I would teach at the university level theater history, drama theory, which still enormously captivates me, and dramatic literature and all that I just love, love, loved. I really learned about the field of dramaturgy in graduate school. Uh, I started applying for dramaturgy jobs, of which there were hardly any at that point in the American theater. And I got one up the road at Indiana Repertory Theater. And kind of the rest is history. I was a dramaturg at the IRT. That was my first position, although I was called literary manager because uh, the founding managing director of the IRT, Ben Mordecai. Oh, may he rest in peace, a magnificent human and theater professional, um, said, no, but nobody's going to like this dramaturgy word. It's too German. Nobody's going to get it. Donors are going to think it's weird. We're going to call you a literary manager. I said, I don't care what you call me if you write me a paycheck every couple of weeks. So I did that uh, for four years, then I moved to New York for about the same amount of time. And then I came back as an associate artistic director and became artistic director. For those people that don't know what a dramaturg is, can you define briefly define sure. that? Sure. Um, a dramaturg is a, is a job function in the theater uh, originally in Germany and then throughout Europe and, and very long standing back into the 18th century. Uh, that is essentially a research and development person, somebody who brought a historical matter into the work of the theater to help contextualize it for the other artists. So, uh, and it's a, still a relatively young field and the American theater didn't really start to be seen on professional theater rosters until the late 70s, early 80s. And then the field started to pick up in part because the regional theater movement was sophisticated enough that directors, professional directors, no longer had time to do their own research, essentially. So dramaturgs work in two ways. Um, on an existing play, they are working on that kind of historical, cultural, historical context of the play. And literally, you're helping actors, designers, audience members, directors to learn a little bit more about what cultural world and history the play comes out of. The other function of dramaturgy is new play development. And dramaturgs, not all dramaturgs do both, but many do. Um, so dramaturgs are, uh, can be helpful to playwrights and to producers to help new plays develop further, principally by asking playwrights questions about how their play is meant to make meaning and might be able to make further meaning with some discourse. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's, the, uh, that's the definition that I would have been more familiar with, uh -huh. uh, having, having knocked that around, playing around in the field of writing, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. write, writing theater pieces. Um, so that, but the historical context, that's kind of, it's interesting to me because one of my questions I was going to ask you is with the IRT and, and you, uh, I was reading somewhere that you, your organization decided, if I'm correct, a number of years ago to stop doing necessarily musical theater. Is that fair to say? Uh, musical, uh, somewhat, traditional, yes, traditional Broadway book theaters in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and because I know any definition of any play, any uh, theatrical presentation these days is expanding every, every, all the time. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, the definition that what can be done, what is tried, those are all being done. And so I see you, your organization somewhere in there. But the reason I ask that is because, for instance, uh, having, a, I was about to be in a civic play here in town, and God bless them, uh, they're a great organization for all of us locally that love to get involved, as are many other amateur 
uh, resources in town for putting on plays, but I also know their bread and butter, like any uh, theater, is going to be crowd pleasers, is going to be the classics that get people in uh, in the seats, uh, mm -hmm. which is often uh, the, the, I, the veteran uh, theater goers, often may perhaps even skewing a bit older, uh, mm -hmm. that love that stuff. And the, the question having to do with you being a dramaturg in a historical sense, so many plays today are are written and then interpreted or modernized mm. into a, a modern setting or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. are, are you a purist? Uh, in other words, do you <laughs> come down politically one side or the other on um, mm. a, a, an older play that uh, you say don't mess with it? Or are you uh, fairly open-minded when it comes to uh, reinterpreting a piece? It depends entirely on the play, Joe, but I want to go back um, to your uh, IRT doesn't do musicals observation. Okay. Um, that, is, uh, that is not a categorical thing, but it is a practice thing. You're right. It's a market-driven practice thing. Uh, Indianapolis has two roadhouses. It also has a two, well, one very large um, avocational theater. Now, the used to be the Indianapolis Civic Theater, is now the Booth Tarkin Theater at the Palladium, at, which is, by the way, one of the oldest, you probably know this, one of the oldest continuously operating amateur theaters in the country. Mm. And uh, the Tarkington does and always has and has an older, far older history than the IRT done very good work. Lots of it musicals. So there's also Footlight and there's all kinds of music venues in this town. When uh, both of my predecessors that I trained under, the artistic directors before me, Tom Haas was hired me and Libby Apple succeeded him, and then I succeeded Libby. Um, both of them uh, were musical lovers, but not necessarily musical directors. And uh, they were artistic directors a little bit more, well, considerably more out of the mold than I am of artistic directors who directed a good deal of the IRT's work. That is not the case with me. But the, the decision for us to not focus largely on musicals was very much market driven, but it was also another stream of what you're talking about, um, both classical and new work driven. For a long, long time and in, in, um, in the Indianapolis uh, you know, market pool, there was nobody producing profess professional Shakespeare or professional classics previous to 20th century at all. There were universities producing it. There were some summer Shakespeare companies producing it in summer, but one of our mission-based mandates is to serve people multi-generationally. And when you look at a whole population of high school kids in Indiana and nobody is producing any Shakespeare or classics that they might ever read when they could ever go see it, seemed like a big market loss to us and something that happened to line up with me and my two predecessors mm -hmm. uh, strengths. So that's kind of the programmatic side of it. Uh, I am not a purist. Um, some people would probably call me a purist and a lot of people say, oh, Janet, she hates musicals. That is not accurate. <laughs> um, I want to say that lot right of now. I, I don't know you that well, but Janet is not. I, I, I'm sorry to plant that in anybody's mind. <laughs> you probably are singing tunes from Oklahoma right now as we're in. Right in, now. Yeah. Actually, what I'm singing right now, Joe, which I've never seen, by the way, is Dear Evan Hansen because my mm. 20 and 23 year olds are home and they're teaching me Dear Evan Hansen during quarantine, which is fascinating. We have for, oh, most of the history of the IRT, which is now 48 years old, produced almost exclusively modern dress Shakespeare. Why? Because our goal in producing Shakespeare is pretty much to convince people, and a lot of those people are going to be high school kids, 
that Shakespeare is relevant to their lives, has something to say to them. So doing it so that it looks like a museum piece or a history piece or a diorama is not helpful for that. I want them to think of Shakespeare as vibrant and necessary and incredibly contemporary. And I can do that a lot but more successfully if they're wearing, if the actors are wearing modern dress and we are interpreting it in essentially a kind of modern viewpoint, um, which is hugely and easily possible with Shakespeare because it's so universal. With, with the uh, original language? Always original language, always. We are purists from that standpoint and have been historically. Um, there's a big and very vibrant movement now um, with uh, theaters, even Shakespeare theaters, um, commissioning reduxes of Shakespeare that are not original language. And some of that stuff is fascinating. Um, I don't think we've ever, we've produced any of it. Uh, so yeah, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a Shakespeare language, but not look or, uh, or um, concept purist. I, I came from um, television business, uh, mm -hmm. working in uh, local television here. And there's a language that goes with anything. Uh, the sure. Where you present the language, you present the, the uh, anchors wearing uh, face makeup so that they don't draw, in that case, an intimate setting, not unlike this, don't draw them away from what they're saying to allow yep. the, the words they're saying to create maximum impact, if you will. Um, yep. But I also came from a church background, and one of the big debates through history is can we redress the Bible, gospel messages, church services, uh, in order to attract a new audience without dumbing down. And I think that's pro probably, that, those, that's a big debate. Can you or can you sure. not? And I think that's sure. a big question because it has to do with relevance in many ways. And, and that would be, get back to my question with uh, IRT, is your mission in part not only to produce uh, classic pieces, but also to, it sounds like, reach an audience of of uh, people that may not uh, be introduced to either theater or like you said earlier, classical theater. Absolutely. Our mission is very, very broad based, Joe. It's, it's about introducing in many ways an art form to people who may not know it. So we're, our service is super broad. We are making work for people who see theater at a very high level all over the world. We're also making work for people who have never been in a theater and maybe never been in a professional theater and everything in between. And so our focus is super multi-focus. It's, it's really broad-based and, and it's also very kind of niched. I mean, we, because we make theater uh, for both adults and children, um, we're looking at all those service areas by age as well. So is it fair, it's is it, pretty it, eclectic. Does that include outside of the theater venue? Uh, I'm sure, you, I'm guessing you have educational, but beyond that, um, just the whole idea of um, not, not Tony and Tina's wedding, something like that that's more environmental. Uh, yeah. But I'm almost yeah. wondering about, does theater extend for you outside of the venue of, a, of the proscenium of the, of the stage? Uh, I would say generally no, Joe. We have done a little bit, I mean a really little bit, of touring in the institution's history, all of it only in Indiana, uh, very purposefully. Um, it would, we would love to someday get back up uh, a touring um, component of our work, but no, the real truth is we have been um, very devoted to our buildings uh, and our building that we've been in since 1980 is a three theater complex owned by the city of Indianapolis on the National Road. It just couldn't be better located in terms of downtown uh, and we've remained very devoted to working in that building. Um, so no, we've, we've had wonderful dreams about, oh, let's do this or that outdoor thing, or let's do this or that touring thing. But we've always ended up, um, 
retrenching our resources into the work that we can make in our building. And I think that's that's paid off for you guys. I would assume a solid direction through the years uh, and solid vision through the years helps establish the security that you guys seem to have. But in other words, it seems I've read about perhaps you have uh, you have uh, money put aside and things like that that gives you a bit of stability that others don't can't brag on. We do, Joe. Um, uh, talking about it in this moment is a little uh, distressing because, of course, all of our financial models are going to take such a big hit. But yes, we we have been uh, and will continue to be a very stable organization. We have a significant endowment. We are one of the uh, largest endowed theaters in the country. We have, um, well, it was a lot more robust in December than it is now, but uh, both endowment and cash reserves. And we've been, um, we have been led by very um, wise boards that have been very, very focused on sustainability. And so that is very, very much our mantra is, it's an institution that needs to be here in 50 years and that's our jobs. And um, I've, I have found that very fulfilling as a sort of mission-driven purpose, that it is an institution meant for longevity so that we can say to our grandchildren, yes, we know it's gonna be there for you. Mm -hmm. So those, it, yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting conundrum in that you, you, do, you do seem to do a really good job in looking over your roster from the last year, uh, some of which, of course, had to be canceled, although you did the uh, Murder on the Orient Express in your lobby, which I, I didn't watch, but that was so great that you could uh, so secure a permission or rights to, to, to tape that or film that. I think that's a lovely idea. And me coming from a multimedia background, I love the idea of expanding storytelling. It's a great idea, I think, always to say, how do we expand the language? But it sounds like in many ways, looking at your roster, uh, and I'm very excited about it, you not only do classics or well-known pieces, but whether you commission them or you find them, uh, pieces that have much more to do with diversity, whether it's age, whether it's race, whether it's religion, that I think is absolutely laudable in, in this environment. And I don't know if that means you have to do three standards to, for every one of the ones mm. that may or may not uh, sell as well. It's like in my business, I might say, I need three paying jobs and then I'll do one gr gratis because I uh, love to give some away as well, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah, our, uh, it's a little less, um, it's a little, the, the percentages are a little looser than that, but you're not, you're not far off. We are usually looking at constructing a season so there are at least a couple of what we call blockbuster titles beyond Christmas Carol. Christmas Carol we have been long devoted to and it continues to be an incredible exchange of story between actors and audience. It is the thing I call it, this is really kind of silly. I call it our gateway drug because it brings people into mm -hmm. the theater that do not normally come because they'll come as a treat for a holiday family event. And if we then can give them a great enough experience that they'll come back one more time to something else, we've succeeded. So that's, so we're often looking at season construction as a couple, at least a couple other really well-known titles. And sometimes we want those titles also to be titles that a high school teacher teaches. An adaptation of a piece of literature, a classic piece of theater, because that helps us also serve uh, a big swath of our um, youth audience. And then we're looking for a handful of things that are not well-known titles on purpose because we think it is our role in a community to be out there scanning, particularly the American theatrical high, say, hey, there's a great play that premiered somewhere else that we can make a beautiful production of for our Indiana home audiences. 
that they're maybe not going to see on the road or maybe it wouldn't it never got that far you know maybe it just lived in a real theater like we are so we consider it our job to do that and we take great joy in discovering that work that are not held titles and more and more we're looking at how those uh often not known titles can also represent other American stories. Stories from communities of color, stories from communities of disability, all kinds of, as you said, stories from other religious viewpoints to try to really capture that there's so many American stories. There's such a plurality of culture in this country and we need to remind, we need to be reminded of that all the time. And We'll also say that in the last, I don't want to, well, five or ten years, Joe, but in the, in the recent past, the new work that is developing out of communities of color and female writers is just like, boom, it is so exciting and on fire. And that stuff is just mowing a lot of us down in the greatest way. And so and, this and it, year we had lots of female writers on our bill. Yeah. But but that is, yeah, I, I after being in the playwrights competition, I don't know if it was you or somebody else suggested uh, checking out the Chicago Dramatists. And of course I'm nowhere close to that, but this is an organization that supports and fosters with classes and readings and other things, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. fledgling or, or up and coming. And I stopped by to see one of their Saturday readings of a like like you said a very um what i would call edgy but a a, a, a a voice that you don't normally hear in the theater in this case whether it's sexual orientation or it has to do with so many other issues of of race and it was powerful it was just a reading mm -hmm. but it blows me away but i also know if they were to mount that somewhere unless they have the most amazing marketing team ever it would be very difficult <laughs> to get an audience that would uh that, that, that would see that. And so that is a very frustrating thing because I know that you came down to Fort Wayne for the, for the uh, Playwright Festival and there's so many people producing stuff, not all of it's very good, uh, but there's probably a ton of stuff that's uh, amazing. And so, but whenever you can bring a piece in like that, I think that's really, that's great because I think we need more diversity like that. Otherwise, I'm just eating the same American food all the time and, and my eyes get closed. And it's probably the same way um, people come to the theater. Uh, they want to see not only something as a cathartic or as an escape, but there's the social side, social challenge of it as well. By the way, have you written, are you a playwright? Or what? If, if, since you started with words and you started with stories, what is your love language or your love expression when it comes to this stuff? Yeah. No, I'm not a playwright, Joe, and I've often um, wondered why, but I, I think the real reason has not changed very much. I have so much respect for playwrights, and I, I, my job as a producer is to hire people who are better than I am at everything. Um, my job is to bring great people together to make great art. So no, I, I, I've really, I've really never even been tempted to write a play. I have been, and I wonder if this will be a pursuit of mine in retirement. I have been interested in uh, some adaptation work. Um, actually, um, just anecdotally, for a long time, I um, played very minorly, really in my head, with an uh, adaptation of Sense and Sensibility, Jane Austen's, because I couldn't find one that I loved. Mm -hmm. And I'm a pretty, I, I'm, I'm pretty um, deep in Austen reading. I'm not an expert from a scholarly perspective by any chance, but a lot of the American adaptations of Sense and Sensibility, I just thought were wrongheaded. Okay. And then I found one a couple years ago that's a British female actually uh, I think probably not coincidentally because there's some ways in which she leans into story that I think just are really captivating and that was the one we were set to do which we um, sadly did not even get into rehearsal before our season had to close down this year so 
Someday, someday, but I don't need to adapt sense and sensibility anymore because there's a gorgeous one. When you get together, by the way, and that's the underlying elephant in the room for all these conversations I'm having about the current lockdown we're in and just the, such an unusual situation, not only, of course, in the United States, but worldwide, um, that's testing every organization, big or small. I'm wondering when you get together with your, whether it's uh, by Zoom or however you do it, uh, with your board, with your staff, what not what are your conversations like about the future i mean do you it, it would be hard and i guess it's part of your job to stay positive but but how do you start to see that i was talking with someone at that was going to be in the play i was going to be in that works at the embassy theater which is a traveling show theater one of the old movie palaces in oh, town okay. and she says when we do start again what's going to happen are people going to only be allowed every seat six seats or, or how, what, how are we doing these things? So I'm curious, um, is it possible to be optimistic or to be uh, even to say, is this gonna produce something new in us uh, with the IRT? Yeah, well, I think first, yes, it's Zoom and FaceTime. I have a couple of colleagues that live close to me and on beautiful days, sometimes we will take walks together. Um, but most of it is Zoom. Um, I think I'm in hour six of Zoom meetings right now. <laughs> and it, it's weird, I just thought earlier today, you know, I actually look forward to weekends more now than I used to when we were working because weekends don't mean anything theater when you're up and running, you're working on weekends. I certainly didn't work every weekend, but when you're around people and you're getting all that energy, it's like, great, who cares? Well, now we're not around people and getting all that energy, so it's very different. Um, I think it's incumbent on us as artists to try to hang on to hope. And I think we are kind of Pollyannas by nature. We believe in what's good about people. Uh, and we also believe that art transmission matters and it can change lives. That is incredibly naive in many ways, Joe, but it is incredibly deep for most practicing artists. We believe that art can change lives. I've seen it happen over and over and over and over and over. So I know it's real. We are gonna have to change as industries hugely now. And I don't think we're, I think we're just at the very beginning of taking out anything about how deep that may be. Um, and so we're talking about all those things you talked about and the beautiful part for lots of art makers in this country is we have community. We have both local community and national community. So we're on the, one of my Zoom calls earlier today was with one of our um, sister theaters that we co-produce a lot in Syracuse, New York. And just hearing the difference, it was me and their artistic director and our two managing directors who are our co-CEOs just hearing how different it is there for them with their conditions than it is for us. And then what also we're all sharing in worry and um, reimaginings and all the things. So, and we also have, um, listen to the birds. I oh my heard gosh. That. I oh, know. It's amazing. So um, we also have a very robust Indianapolis arts council and they've been convening calls every Friday morning and there's usually 90 of us on these calls with the state arts folks, the city arts folks, and then a lot of public health folks trying to help us navigate. And you know, the real bottom line for everybody is we don't know. We, we know, I think there's more kind of opportunity to think sooner about the museum folks than there are about the live performance folks. In, usually here in Indianapolis, the museum folks are some of our closest collaborators. Right now, it doesn't feel like that so much. It feels like the symphony and dance kaleidoscope and the other dance companies and the other live music um, companies are the ones we have the most in common with. And we've all got the same concerns. How can we reconvene and protect both audiences and performers? 
And while we can seat audiences far apart, we can insist that they wear masks and we can have hand sanitizer all over the place and only do intermissionless plays, we cannot use those same tools to protect actors and crew. So, uh, and there's a lot of work being done to formulate ideas about how to protect actors and crews, whether that will still make our work viable or not, I don't think anybody. It's, a, it's, it's fascinating if you stand back, but I know living in it every day, and I was going to ask about your family. You don't have to answer, you can. But I mean, the idea Happy that to. we not only have a bit of cabin fever, uh, but there's this constant thread of, of concern in everybody, whether you're t worried about the economy, your job, your organization, uh, world, world uh, any of the numerous world issues that are going on right now that create a kind of... Um, malaise whether it's emotional yes. or mental or whatever so i'm curious with you yeah. and your your girls and your family uh is that something that uh are you do you are, do you get grounding uh in your life and in such a way that you guys have been able to to talk through this thing pretty well amongst each other i absolutely have grounding in my family joe and i'm very grateful for that um my husband is a career stage manager now largely retired so he has spent his life in the theater as well we have three kids our oldest child is my stepson um, who lives in china wow. and his fiance uh were out of china on vacation during chinese new years during the worst of it they live in suburban Guangzhou, so they were able to get back their English teachers. They're not working again yet, but we, we've been in very close touch with them and mercifully they're healthy and China seemed to be really, you know, restaurants are reopening, everything except schools in their province are reopening. So we get a lot of um, solace from seeing them on WeChat in various forms. Um, we have then together, Joel and I have a 23-year-old and a 20-year-old, and um, they're both here, uh, and that has been a huge gift to me. Um, Nira, our youngest, are our theater people. <laughs> you know, it seems like in the theater, either your kids go straight into acting or designer directing, or they move way far away, and ours are in the latter category. Our youngest is studying animal to be here at Purdue, uh, and is a dog trainer, an animal whisperer, and um, service dog enthusiast. Our middle one, who's Elisa's pal, um, has a degree from uh, IU SPIA, uh, the O'Neill School, in um, nonprofit management she spent one week in arts nonprofit management one week and then she said oh no way so she her passions are social justice she was doing she is doing americorps city year program in chicago um, but that's all school based and they've been out of the school since you know i don't know early march so she's come home for a little while uh, even though she is working, uh, AmeriCorps, unlike Peace Corps, is still hard to work. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we try to convene for dinner. We're all off doing our things during the day. Um, we play a lot of games at night. We are watching movies together. We're doing a lot of cooking together. We're now gardening together because now the, the weather is good enough yeah. to get us outside. So we're making a big vegetable garden and... Now, I feel uh, uh, utter gratitude that two of our three kids are here, and that really keeps me buoyed. And I, I, yeah, it's kind of an unexpected together time, and if, you, if everybody gets along, that's a lovely, there are benefits to this. It's like my wife or a lot of people, I work from home anyway in my business, but uh, she's, of course, like so many people who work from home a lot, but it's the idea of how many people are going to be want, want to be uh, reintroduced to nine to five in a in an office or a cubicle which is a, just an interesting social experiment but uh, you know it's it, it, of course it's a very serious thing but there's also just so many questions like you said not only with with the uh, theater but with every uh, every business everybody out there saying what's next what's next 
Uh, so I, I think it's great uh, that way, if I can stay optimistic. And that's one of the things I say, today I'm optimistic. That's all I can, I'm like uh, alcoholic. Yeah. Today, I, today's good. That's great. That's good, Joe. And I'm not every day. There's, yeah. I've had days where I just say to my family, okay, I'm in the slew of despond today. So has anybody got a good idea of a distraction? And, but, um, and it, actually at the beginning of the quarantine, I, I, I found it very depressing to watch plays online or to read plays. Now I can read plays and it will solace me, but it took me a while. And that was very scary to me because it's been such a baseline of my life. I read plays all the time. So I'm glad that returned. Um, yeah. So I, it's interesting you say that, Janet, by the way. Are you saying almost from a, and I'm reading more into this than I should, a philosophical point of view, they are your solace or they are your comfort. The idea that almost you get lost in those things. I mean, play right reading is a bit of a dry experience unless you imagine I'm imagining the characters in your head. Sounds like very much your, your heart. Uh, it, it is a part of my heart. I, I don't read plays necessarily um, just for fun. I certainly read as a producer, but but good plays certainly lift me. My uh, The thing I absolutely have to do to sort of function is I read fiction and I read The New Yorker mm -hmm. every day. So fiction has been my sort of lift point since I was a little, little, little kid. And actually, the opportunity to read more outside of plays during this period of time has been tremendously a balm for me. I'm, um, I'm a sort of borderline introvert that has to perform a lot of extroverted functions in my work. And so actually having some of this reflective time has been... Um, as horrible as it is, the reason has been very therapeutic for me. And I, I know for a lot of my, my, my colleagues, Suzanne Sweeney, our managing director, who's also kind of a borderline introvert, extrovert, has discovered that she's more of an extrovert than she thought. So she is like, get me out of here. And I'm, uh, I think... I'm finding more respite than she is. So, I think that's a, know. yeah, it's a chance. It may not be, it's not wanted, but it's a chance. No. It's like God put put the world on pause, uh, or at least the mechanism of, of the world, if you want to look at it that way, and said, all right, take a breath, step away, because uh, it, it, you're, many of us, we're, we're in business or we're in whatever we do day after day after day after day, and uh, you start to easily could lose your passion or lose your perspective or lose your focus and start to do it rotely. I always said in my business, uh, all the news promos, I used to do news promos for the TV station and they all went to the same conferences and they all read the same magazine. So every news station in the country looked the same or in the church business, if I call it a business, they all go to the same uh, conferences. They all read the same books. And so many church services uh, uh, look amazingly, shockingly similar. It's good sometimes to step away. And again, I, that's not, I'm, I don't mean to be pre prescriptive because I'm not. Uh, other than I think it's been good for me to step away and say, what's going on here? What, what is my 24 hours made of? And especially, of course, as I get older, what am I doing with my life now in the final X part of my life? Uh, and I don't look at it morbidly, but I say, what am I doing with it? And is, am I, is it something I'm going to be happy with? Is it something that's bringing not only me some sort of peace or joy, but also am I building in, hopefully, not that I have that much to give one way or other, but building into something else or someone else? Mm. Uh, because I tend to be incredibly, uh, otherwise I tend to be incredibly self-focused or uh, prideful or egotistical. And I think those are the things I want to fight against uh, in many ways. So mm -hmm. it's good for me to take an outside focus once in a while and get it off myself. Uh, that's one of the benefits, by the way, of, of one of the reasons I'm using you. Uh, I'm, you've been kind enough to talk with me today 
because I just kind of want to hear other people's perspectives on uh, on how. Well, you've been. It sounds like you're using this to be really deeply introspective, Joe, and that's it's really commendable. That's taking a horrible situation and making opportunity out of it, and I. I find that a really tough proposition when I think about it professionally because, uh, you know, the core exchange that makes the art that I support matter is not possible now. You know, the governor this afternoon lifted the, uh, we can now go from 10 people to gatherings of 10 people to gatherings of 25 people. And that's great for some industries and it's not for ours. Well, to finish, to, to, to round the corner here, and although it's not, this question doesn't necessarily lend itself to that. If yours is the, how do you define that then, the transmission of? Is it, pers- it, it it's, it's uh, in person, perhaps? Yes, it's live, it, it's absolutely. Live, it's, it's dimensional, even though yes. perhaps it's, yes. not, it's not surrounding you the same way certain things are. It's, there's a dimension to it. So yes. you're... you're and of course, this is no surprise to anybody that's been in theater or any kind of uh, arts program where you need to see something in person. In other words, you were saying earlier you were watching some shows on 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 YouTube or on whatever, and it's just not the same because it's a, it's a flatter experience. It's an experience where you can escape uh, rather than stay immersed in it. I would suppose is one of the ways you'd look at it. But that is interesting. That of course, theater. There's something about the proximity. There's something about being next to a person in the theater. Yes, yes. Share the experience with you. It is key. The, that's key, Joe, I think. It's social. Now, um, because when I go, I love movies. And I thought for a while I would become a film historian in undergraduate school because I found um, movie making so captivating. But when I go to a movie theater, I don't want to hear anybody else's reaction. I don't want to sit close to them. I, I don't care. I want to monofocus. When I'm in the theater, I'm constantly turning around like this to see, oh, wow, I didn't think that was funny, but that person thought it was funny. Or that person was moved and went, oh, I love that stuff. That's what the, is innate to the theater is reminding us what social beings we are. And that we're both, we, all, we have both herd mentality and we have massively different viewpoints all at the same time. If we can't sit next to people, what does that do to our art form? Now, I mean, obviously what we're all talking about is you'll be able to go with your fill in the blank, your friend, your spouse, your family. But then you're going to, we're going to have to create likely some sort of barrier of space around your little group. What does that do to the experience? Uh, I can't remember who said this to me in the last 48 hours was, are we going to have to put plexiglass screens up at the edge of the stage to keep the actors spit from hitting audience members? And that makes me just cry. It, mm-hmm. It's terrible. I would rather just say, okay, we're not going to sell the front two rows. We're, if we're lucky enough to get back in the foreseeable future to selling anything. So it's a crazy conundrum. It's a big quagmire. It's going to cause us all to think new and to reimagine. And uh, we have to embrace that. And I just want to say, it sounds like you're approaching it. You seem to be doing it in a way that uh, you're very, I can tell your passion, obviously, being the part of an organization for as long as you have. Uh, but, But beyond that, uh, I could also see, and, and it's it's the, what's interesting to you. It's not just a financial thing. It's the which, of course, financial is a big part of anything like that. But it's also the fact that you want people uh, to have a growth experience, if you will. If you look at theaters more than simply a cathartic, which is its own kind of growth, an emotional experience, you want them to also to have an experience that expands their idea of what the world is, yes. what experience of other people is and things like that. And I think that's very laudable. And often that's the thing where group dynamics create an energy you're not going to get anywhere else. Exactly. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that kind of gurus in our business are saying now is that um, this period of time will completely and forever redefine people's idea of digital art. 
I guess those of us in my field are hoping <laughs> that it also redefines the difference between digital experience and live. I, I we can be hopeful and intentional about that. There's also there's always more power when you're sitting right next to a conversation and seeing the person face to face. There's something incredibly powerful. Not that this isn't really great, but there uh, if you've done six hours of Zoom, there's only so much. Uh, <laughs> there, there's only so much relating you can do after a while. So I commend I commend your stamina, Janet. Uh, oh, you know what? This is the first one where I've only had to look at one person, Joe, yeah, instead yeah. of four, eight, sixteen. So. I, I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you for the rigor of your questions and, yeah. and your passion about this field as well. Anything? Well, I, uh, I look forward, and I'm, I'm serious about this, looking forward to see how not only you, but uh, my nephew's been involved not only with you guys, but Boy, with he sure act, has. Actors Theater, where I saw a wonderful show, uh, Sweeney Todd production. I and saw the, it too. And Summer Stock in, in Indianapolis yeah. is thriving with all the kids there. So many great venues for people to get that. So I'm going to be watching with... Uh, avid curiosity how everybody's approaching this and I don't look at it from I don't want to look at it from morbid I'm excited to see what happens but I also know that the challenges are real so good luck to you and uh, I hope you. you keep up the good fight thanks for great conversation Joe have a great weekend in the convertible Woo! well I'm sure we're gonna go to Amish country and say hi to the cows excellent all right sounds Jan fun Janet, take care so Joe be bye -bye. well